So my name is Anna Soubry. I'm a Member of Parliament for Broxstow, which is in Nottinghamshire. I was a member of the Conservative Party. I left the Tory Party and I'm now a member of Change UK. So it's a very brave move to leave the Conservative Party and move over to Change UK, despite threats. How has the experience been for you? Well, for me, I've never regretted it, and it felt a very natural thing to do. I mean, I was, I was sorry to leave some of the activists in Broxstow who'd helped, you know, me get elected, frankly, and you know, walked the streets, knocked on doors, all weathers for many years, and so on and so forth. But for, in terms of in political terms, I mean, I always. I've always said and I feel very strongly that it was the Conservative Party that's left me and I believe actually they've, they've left millions of other people because it's moving to the right. We can see this now in this ghastly leadership contest where the winner is clearly going to be one strain of a no-deal hard Brexit representing the right wing of the Conservative Party and the idea that the party is a broad coalition um, is I think absolutely gone. And so I've never doubted it was the right thing to do. The Tory party, as I say, on that move to the right. And I think we need to fix our broken politics, which I have no doubt are absolutely broken in this country. Um, one of the things that that means is that setting up a new party um, to capture that centre, moderate, sensible, but radical and progressive ground is absolutely critical. So could you speak more about what Change UK represents? Well, it, 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 it does represent that centre ground. So you've got people who left the Conservative Party, One Nation Conservatives, and then you've got the old sensible, moderate Labour people, eight of them that left their party. We've come together in, to represent that centre ground, that sensible, as I call it, moderate way that is the traditional way of actually doing things in our country. I think it absolutely represents the majority of people in our country and it's been abandoned by the two main parties as they've been gripped by the extremes of British politics and other parties just frankly haven't been able to step up and meet the new challenge that's there. And how has your experience of the European elections been? Well I mean I think it's been an amazing achievement that we actually fielded 70 candidates. I mean we literally selected these people in a matter of 10 days a week and we had 3,700 people applying. You look at the other two main parties, I mean, they were begging people to stand as candidates. We were almost saying to people, please don't apply because we've got so many people applying, say 3,700. And then we've had rallies throughout Great Britain, which have been really successful. We've signed up, you know, I think it was in two weeks, we signed up another 2,000 supporters. So we've now got 98,000 supporters and people who are all absolutely behind this project. But I think we've done really well just to have fielded those candidates taken part in these elections. And do you think the Lib Dems could have been good allies for you, or could be? Well, you know, if I'd wanted to join the Lib Dems, I would have joined the Lib Dems. I mean, the first political party I ever joined was the Liberals. And I think, you know, I'm sure they've done really well tonight, and good on them for that. I think we just have to be really honest about this. You know, since the 2016 referendum, the Libs really haven't captured, if you like, the, the Remain vote, especially the more uh, moderate, centrist, um, disaffected Conservative, disaffected Labour ground. They just haven't done that. They did well in the uh, local elections, and so they should, because that last set of elections was held in 2015 when they did spectacularly badly. And of course, they had the bounce of those local elections that meant that they were really gaining speed, as you'd expect, into these EU elections. And I, I mean, I have no doubt there will be people who normally vote Labour. We know that there were members of the Conservative Party, people like Met Michael Heseltine, Matthew Paris from The Times, for example, who voted Lib Dems. Now, I would have loved them to have put their faith and lent us their vote, but they didn't. We could have a discussion as to why that was. But I think the most important thing is going to be the overall Remain vote. Uh, but I think we have to have some honest talk about you know, what's happened with the Lib Dems. And actually that then flows into my views about what we should be doing with politics, because one of the things that's blighted British politics for too long is the inability of politicians to be honest with the British people on any particular subject. 
That's why we've found the rise of populism. That's why I think we're getting the drift off to the extremes. You know, there's this great big gap there in the middle and it needs filling with politicians that will be honest and then also base their policies and their, belief, their, their vision for our country based on evidence and not just on dog whistle and ideological cheap populism. And so would you see the success of the Brexit party in that need for honesty in politics? Or is it that people are focused on a Brexit even if it's a no deal Brexit? You know, the Brexit party is one of the most dishonest um, bunch of uh, politicians led by, by Nigel Farage, who has spent a career peddling myths, preying on people's prejudices, fueling their fears, and being the, you know, the embodiment to me of, of a dishonest form of politics. Because people have been sold this idea that we can leave the European Union and everything's going to be better, which is baloney. Because we know that however you cut it, Brexit is going to harm our economy uh, and it will harm our country in other ways as well, but it will certainly harm us economically. Uh, and he's still peddling this nonsense that if we leave the European Union, and now of course he's changed his tack and he's saying, oh, we leave without a deal, which is not what people were promised, which really will be catastrophic for our country. So I think he's the embodiment in his party of the dishonest, of part of the dishonesty in British politics that's got us into the dreadful state that we're undoubtedly in. And so how will you focus on this uh, after the European elections? What will Change UK's focus be? Well, I, I very much hope now that we will absolutely get ourselves together as a party, as a political force, because I don't doubt that there are millions of people out in the, out in the real world who are crying out for some party to represent them and nobody at the moment represents them um, and it's like I, I describe it we're not so much building a movement the movement's there it just needs a home that it can rest in where it feels it's got competent leadership and it's got genuine honest politics and sound policies based on evidence and what and with a vision for the future and what would be key successes <clears throat> for change UK Ooh, I don't know what would, be, what would be key success. I think it would be now to get out and start to build that manifesto. Uh, with the, the plan is to talk to people, uh, that includes experts, uh, about the sort of policies that we should have on all the big topics that our country faces, uh, both here in the United Kingdom, in Europe, and obviously throughout the world, climate change being a really good example of that. Um, and we need to now come up with the policies for the future. Because our country is in a terrible place and nobody is addressing those big issues and it's like the rest of the world is going on by like this river you know it's flowing on by <laughs> and we're not even in a boat on it we're just like nowhere at the moment because we're consumed by Brexit which is completely stifling everything uh, that we should be doing. And a lot of smaller parties have often focused on uh, how representative democracy doesn't uh, benefit them and they've focused on the voting system that we have in place. Is this something that Change UK would look at? Absolutely. Look, I, I've, I've, I like, the thing I like about First Past the Post, uh, and I know because my friend Joe Swinson uh, reprimanded me about this, that you can have a system of proportional representation that still delivers a person for a constituency. Right? You can do that, I know that. Uh, I also, though, like the idea. I like I like what they do in Wales and what they do in Scotland, uh, but notably in Wales, where you have you have your constituency MP, but then you also have a more of a list system, so that you really make sure you've got a properly representative uh, set of of, of um, members of, as it happens, the Welsh Assembly. But uh, and I can see that, that there must be a way that we do this because the thing that I do know as an MP is that your constituents like that one person that they can go to and say, can you help me with this? Can you do this for me? Yeah, and you are directly accountable to those people, but also you have a relationship with people so they can come to you and you can do stuff for them that need, that they, that need sorting out. And it's, it's a feature of MPs work, which actually is not much talked about. It's got nothing to do with politics, but it's actually a substantial part of what we actually do as members of parliament. So it's really important. And working with other members of Parliament now in Change UK, are you seeing 
are your own opinions changing? Working with Labour MPs? No, because that change had already happened. Okay. I mean, I'd worked with Chuck Ramuna and Chris Leslie for nearly three years now since the referendum. I'd got to know Chuka during the referendum and then obviously afterwards. You know, this, it, it hacks me off a bit that people say, oh, uh, you all need to work together. Well, we've been chuffing working together for the last three years. We've not talked about it very much because a lot of it has been very quiet. We just get on and do it. And noticeably on Brexit, the level of cross-party working is, has, been, it has been incredible. And if people knew the trust that there has been, so there's a WhatsApp group that I can think of, which represents every single, every single political party is in this group, apart from the Brexit party, because it's parliamentary uh, political parties. It's never leaked, never leaked. It's got Tories, Labour, Plaid, SNP, uh, Caroline Lucas, Tor um, obviously Change, Labour, we're all on it. And we speak very freely and we work together uh, in relation to Brexit, never leaked. And I think that says everything. So is it actually an example of a really good time or a healthy time for politics? No, it's a really shit time in politics, actually. I think so, anyway. I think it's appalling what's going on. We've got this awful beauty parade of all these dreadful, hard Brexiteers, you know. It's just going to be a question of time before it gets really dirty and nasty. And There'll be a lot of that dog whistle type politics pandering to what is now a shrinking electorate of the Conservative Party, but it's a con the, the membership has changed because it's been infiltrated by a lot of the old UKIPers, and you've got people who will who's going to be the most right wing? That's how they're going to that's how they're going to win that election. Who can be the hardest Brexiteer, the most irresponsible Brexiteer? And who can pander the most to the right wing that's taken over the Tory party? I think that's pretty appalling. Um, and as I say, in the meantime, the real problems that we should be looking at are just getting, just not being done. So where's this green paper on social care? Now, it's all well and good, the government, and I congratulate them for putting an extra £20 billion into the NHS, which it needed, of course. But it's, you know, we just keep throwing money at it, which is almost soaking up. The, the, or dealing with the mess, but we're not actually solving the, many of the problems, which is one about how we make sure that we look, that people look after themselves better and we prevent a lot of illnesses and people getting sick in the first place. And of course, the other huge piece of work, which we still haven't done, is hook up social care in the NHS. And the situation with too many older people who are not getting the proper um, social care and the health care that they need means that there is this huge amount of the NHS which is just mopping it all up whereas actually we should be investing because you know we know what the population is going to do that's the one thing we can predict how long people are going to live the sort of illnesses and diseases they'll be living with and yet we're not putting into place the sort of stuff that we should be to be able to mitigate a lot of that and actually stop older people having to go to the hospital in the first place because they've been properly looked at in either their care home or in their home. So there's masses of work that's got to be done and nobody's doing it. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.